Hi, welcome to the Wife of Caesar. Happy Monday to all. And my name is Michelle Levien or Michelle Levien, either is fine. And as you know, the Wife of Caesar is Striner's project to talk about corruption using everyday words so that we can uh, fight or undertake corru corruption in our day-to-day -day lives with a little bit more than good intentions. Great, so as always, we have three sections. Our first section is the news, the second section is a case, and then we will deal with a typology. Awesome, so let's move on to the news. So on the news this week, um, it has been really all over, or at least all over here in Mexico. The, the president of Mexico, to give a little bit of context, has been talking a lot, a lot about people who are uh, public officials who serve as public officials in uh, state-owned entities. A state-owned entity is a company owned by the government. Uh, the, so these people work in a state-owned entity. And then after some time, uh, after their, their, uh, their office is done or their term in, in office is done, they decide to move to the private sector, which is very, very common. Now, and also not illegal. He, here, the question um, that the president uh, brings forward is whether or not this is ethical. And although it is not illegal, it doesn't mean that that, that doesn't mean that it doesn't concern corruption. Why? Because it does raise a, a, a problem with conflict of interest. Okay, so, so let's uh, take a quick reminder. For those of, of us who don't know, conflict of interest is when the interest of the organization for which we work goes one way and my personal interest or our personal interest goes the other. That by itself it's not, is not necessarily bad, but the issue is that we have to have a, quite a grasp on it to be aware of that conflict of interest and uh, obviously to notify it so that the company can take measures uh, when that conflict of interest might become something dangerous. Okay, today under, under current law, under current Mexican law, people who work, public officials, public officials who work for a state-owned entity don't have the obligation to wait uh, anything less than a year or they only have to wait for one year after their, their, their post is done to go work in the private sector. Now they can work in the private sector the day after they finish their term in office, but they cannot work in the same area where they worked in the public sector. And th this makes a bit of sense. The, pur the purpose of this law, and I, I would argue not to you know, defend the president, but I I one could argue that when a public official goes to work for the private sector, he or she is generally offered that position way before the, their post is over. It's very common that uh, you, you are related and you do work with companies in the private sector and the people with whom you work are satisfied, happy, or impressed with your work and the, the, in, with your professionalism. And very, it, it very often is the case that they will ask you to join the private sector once you are done. That, again, by itself is not illegal. The problem with that is that if you are asked to do so, say, one year before you, let, you leave your post, or even, even one month, you still have one month of public office work to do. And if during that time you have to make decisions that might be influenced by that offer, then you may, may be engaging in a conflict of, you know, you obviously are engaging in a conflict of interest and you may be engaging in a corrupt act. Now, that, that would be one of the issues. And one the, the major issue for which I think the, the president's idea is not entirely, not entirely bad, I would say, is uh, privileged information. When you work in a state-owned entity, you probably work with regulated or, or sometimes classified information. And if you take that information with you, you only wait one year and then you, you are able to use that information for your own benefit or for the benefit of the private sector or someone in the private sector, then that might very well actualize a conflict of interest and an act of corruption. And we're dealing with industries, or at least in Mexico, strategic industries deal with the production of energy and production of general resources that are managed by, by the government or have to be regulated by the government. So for example, energy. These contracts last for 20 to 25 years. So one year off of that is, is really nothing, uh, at least concerning privileged information. So it, for this particular reason, Limiting the, the, the ability to move to the private sector might be a good thing. Okay, so let's move on to the case. Today, we will talk about Australia Australia, and the Australian Parliament. Today, our case doesn't deal with corruption, but rather it deals with anti-corruption. The Australian Parliament is working and has very recently passed a new law protecting whistleblowers and regulating the, the act of whistleblowing. For those of us who don't know, whistleblowing is uh, to, to make a public report, to make private information about corruption public. 
And you may be familiar for, uh, uh, with this term from certain movies or from the Siemens case, from the Walmart case. In these particular cases, ca huge cases like the, the Brazilian Lava Jato case and, and cases like that, whistleblower action or reports by ordinary citizens are crucial because they uh, most of the times they contain information, cr uh, critical information that leads to evidence and that evidence is actionable and this is what we use to bring forth forward the cases. The problem with whistleblowing is that it has to be regulated for two reasons. It has to first provide protection to whistleblowers, make, make people safe, feel safe to, um, to report corruption. And the other reason is that it, it must provide some sort of incentive. People have to be able to, to, to feel like they are receiving something out of reporting corruption. Why is this relevant? Well, in some countries, for example, the US, <clears throat> whistleblowing has been regulated for quite some time and all whistleblowers receive a fraction, I believe at least 30% of whatever funds are recovered uh, from, the, from their report, from their whistleblowing, which is, you know, it, it does create a very generous incentive for people to come forward. But there is potential for abuse because people might start, uh, particularly some lawyers, obviously not the lawyers in Steiner, obviously, of course not. But some lawyers, some law firms might start exploiting this and as they have, for example, class action lawsuits and turn that into a money-making business, which again, it's not entirely bad, but it shouldn't be, it should not be abused. I bring this up because this is relevant, particularly in Mexico, because Mexico doesn't have legislation protecting whistleblowers or regulating, regulating whistleblowing. Of course, uh, you know, reports anonymous or otherwise are welcome, but they are very, they're almost never uh, rewarded. And there is no, there is no legal infrastructure providing for the protection of the whistleblowers or the people who are making the report. Now, we do also have to say, it, it, we, ha we have to uh, acknowledge the good work that is being done by our legislators. And today, Mexican legislators are discussing creating whistleblowing protection provisions or whistleblowing protection laws. And what they are mainly concerned with uh, today is whether or not they want to offer rewards to whistleblowing. They, they are reviewing documents and, and different different studies and research done by people in, in Mexico and in other countries um, trying to analyze whether or not this this type of incentive is a good thing or not. Again, uh, there's always the potential for abuse, but it is interesting that they are studying this. So, so it isn't known whether or not whistleblowers will be given rewards. I personally, I think the incentive is very good. I just think that it should be regulated so as to avoid any potential for abuse. Uh, but what is known is that the law, whatever law we come up with, it, it'll provide for whistleblowing protection, which is crucial because, again, you are reporting you or you would be reporting a crime and reporting crimes always carries an element of danger. And the, what the, the, the purpose of this law is to, to provide, to remove that, that potential for, for danger and make people comfortable with bringing forth uh, reports and this this is very sad because today again we don't have any type of whistleblowing protection. This is why we always end every every one of our programs with you know warning you about staying safe and and reaching out to people who know about this this issue. And hopefully in the future this won't even be necessary because maybe we'll have regulations that are sophisticated enough to protect everyone. All right, so let's move on to the typology. Uh, as we mentioned every episode, a typology is a model or an example of something. So in the case of corruption, it is the concrete steps in which we perform a corrupt act. So for, I, I, I'll give you one example that is very common, at least in developing countries like Mexico. Um, we have the crime of bribery, right? But in, in Mexico, we, we even call it colloquially, we call it something else, something different. And the way you do that crime, for example, is when you pay off, uh, or when one, not, not you obviously, but when one would pay off uh, a, a traffic uh, policeman, it, it is very often they will give you the the, the rules of the road, the, the a little booklet containing the, the transit code, I guess you would call it. And it is very, it is common knowledge or known by everyone that they give you the, the little booklet, for, not for the purpose of you reviewing the actual rules, but for the purpose that, of you putting, uh, you know, money in the booklet. So that would be a typology for road bribery. Don't do, don't, don't do that. Nobody does. Well, people do it, but don't do it. 
The typology today deals with not-for-profit organizations chosen by public officials. Okay, this is tricky because we, we mentioned that the typology of bribery is you paying a public official for her doing something that she shouldn't do or doing something faster than she should. It is an improper payment in exchange for something. Great. Almost never would a public official tell you openly, I want money in exchange for this because they are not stupid or, well, yeah, they're dishonest, but they're not stupid. And it's very risky. What they will do is hint and insinuate. And one of the ways that they do this is they hint at a charitable organization, a non-for-profit organization, and insist that you review them and insist that you check them out and then you see some what the, some of the work that they're doing. And again, this is tricky because the, the, the devil is in the details. This could be very nuanced. They, they will almost never say, I am related to this organization and if you want my services or if you want to benefit from my work, then you should give money to it. But they will hint, they will insist on you checking out their work. They will insist upon on you giving money to a particular organization. And this isn't necessarily a bad thing. That doesn't mean that this is a bribe. So the trick to, to figuring out whether or not you're being asked for a bribe is uh, when, when you run into someone that starts talking about a chari charitable organization, listen to them and talk about the topic. And if you're interested, tell that public official that you will review that and that you will try to figure out which organization works for the same cause, not the organization, but the cause, and see which one works better for your company. If you're essentially saying, yes, I will help your cause, this is important, but I will find another way to do it. I will find another organization. I won't give money to the person you're telling me. If she insists, however, on you you know, paying money to a particular organization or only choosing that person or that not-for-profit uh, charity, then that should that should uh, raise every red flag in the book. Okay, so the, the, the best way to do it is if you are, just remember, if you are approached by someone uh, with whom you are doing business and she is a public official, she mentions a particular charity or charitable organization, then, and you're interested, Explain to her that you're interested in the cost. Don't, don't even mention corruption. Just say, yeah, I will look into that cost and see what organization fits me best to help them. And if she insists on you choosing a particular place, a particular person, a particular charity, then that should tell you more than you know, than you know today. Okay, so that was it for today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I wish you a, a very, very happy and very productive Monday. And thank you for joining us at The Wife of Caesar. Again, my name is Michelle Levin or Michelle Levin, either is fine. And I must remind you, as I always do, uh, it is important to report corruption. Do raise your voice, do blow the whistle, but always, always, always stay safe. If you feel that there is some type of danger, if you feel that you are at risk, or if you are unsure about whether or not what you are facing is uh, an act of corruption, don't, don't put yourself at risk. Uh, do yourself a favor, get, drop us a line at info at striner.mx, and we will be glad to help in any way we can. So again, this, is, was, this has been the Wife of Caesar. Thank you for joining us and goodbye.